Good morning. It's Wednesday, and I'm so honored to be with you today. We're going to be talking about an amazing lesson that's very pertinent to this journey of Lent. It's all about who, who we're pleasing. Are we seeking the praise of men or of God? And it, it, that's a way of basically saying, are we here to get the adulation of the crowd, or do we come here to do what God has asked us to do. In other words, are we pleasing people around us no matter what? Or are we doing what's pleasing to God? And that's a very hard distinction that I want to explore with you and hopefully you'll take something from it as I'm trying to take something from it as well. So we begin prayers at midday. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells its tale to another. One night imparts its knowledge to another. Although they have no words, although they have no language, and their voices cannot be heard, their sound goes out into all the lands their message to the very ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The prayer for Psalm 19. O God, the source of life, you have filled this earth with beauty. Open our eyes to see your gracious hand in all of your works, that rejoicing in your creation, we may learn to serve you with gladness for the sake of him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Paul wrote to the church in Galatia these words, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you, and also with you the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become children of the light. After Jesus had said this, he departed and hid from them. Although he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe in him. This was to fulfill the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah, Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And so they could not believe, because Isaiah also said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, so that they might not look with their eyes, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw his glory and spoke about him. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human glory more than the glory that comes from God. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I want to talk to you about this idea. Are we here? And during this Lenten time and, and all of our lives, are we here to please humanity or are we here to please God? Pleasing humanity is a very, uh, very tempting thing because every one of us likes to be popular. Uh, my mother, when I was a little boy, used to send me out to play and say, make some friends, you know, become popular. And for my, my, my sister and myself, being popular became very important to us. We wanted to please people. We wanted to be well thought of. And I think that's true of many young people, particularly today. You want to be part of the crowd. You want to be part of what everyone else is doing. 
at one time I had a bishop um, who came from a military background and the bishop made it very clear that he looked at us uh, clergy particularly as his officers. In other words, he was kind of the general and we were his officers who were working with the people who are various parishes who were the soldiers. So he used that as his way of an analogy of how we were to be and we would always obey our bishop and do what we were told to do um, and do our job very well and if we did do our job well then we would move up the ladder like in the military. In the military you move from a lieutenant to a captain to a major to lieutenant colonel then colonel and so on. Well in the church they used to say well you'd move from being a priest to being a uh, maybe a regional dean, uh, maybe a canon somewhere along the way, archdeacon, and eventually bishop, and, and so on. So you'd move up the ranks, if you will, to that, just like the military. And many clergy have thought that way. Well, I guess I found myself being um, a Franciscan at heart. I never saw myself as being always total obedient. For instance, a few years ago, bishops came out and said basically that we were to give communion to most people, but we were to put in our bulletin something saying that if you are not baptized, you're welcome to come up for a blessing. In other words, unbaptized people should not be having Holy Communion. You had to be baptized to receive communion. Now, it didn't say what denomination had to baptize you, but baptism is looked at as, as a sacred rite and you had to be baptized to have communion. So what I did in my bulletin was I put in the bulletin saying, all are welcome at communion. Um, I was taken on the carpet by that by a bishop who said, why would you say that when we've told you you have to have baptism in order to be a communicant? And I said, well, you know, Jesus didn't ask people if they had been baptized when he welcomed people um, even the, the apostles, when he had dinner with them and did the first communion and tore the bread and the wine, uh, when he had 5,000 people and he tore the bread and divided up the fish, he did not ask them if they'd been baptized. And I don't see why they are not welcome at communion. So I confessed to the bishop that I am not always obedient. Uh, another thing that happened when I was working was that the people of New Hampshire diocese elected a gay bishop. And electing a gay bishop, um, our bishop came out and said basically, we are no longer in communion with that diocese because they have elected a gay bishop. Um, now how to tell people who are visiting you if they're from New Hampshire or not, or if they're welcome at communion or not, I don't know. I suppose you could put a bulletin in the bulletin notice that all those who come from the diocese of New Hampshire are not welcome at communion. But again, I thought to myself, this is kind of silly. Uh, if the people have entrusted this human being with the chosen, who's been chosen as the shepherd of God for their diocese, who am I to say that they're not welcome in communion in our diocese? So I'm not sure I would always make it up the ladder easily because I didn't do all the obedient things. But then I surprised that bishop because I was elected by my peers, my fellow clergy, to be the regional dean. And by doing so, they sort of pushed me up the ladder, even though the bishop did not want to push me up the ladder. Jesus said, don't work for the approval of humanity. Don't work to please what other people think. Do what you do to please God. Do what you do out of your belief of what God is calling you to do. And I've always found that more important. I can't get the praise of men always, but I also know I have to do what God's asking me to do what seems right, what seems fair, what seems to be in my prayer life something that I can do. I watched a movie <clears throat> on the weekend that hopefully some of you have seen. It's, it's from a book called The Shack, and the movie is simply called that too, The Shack. It's a very powerful movie. It's a movie about a man who is out with his family on a camping trip, and he's got the kids all lined up to head home, and suddenly they look for the little girl, his little youngest daughter and she's gone and it turns out that in fact his daughter has been kidnapped or disappeared later you find out that in fact the daughter has become a victim of of some kind of a crazy killer and so he he is just torn apart by guilt and fear of what's happened to his daughter and that he should have been a better father and so on and one in 
said one day he gets a letter in his mailbox that invites him to the shack to come to the shack that's somewhere nearby. He finally does go and he walks into what really is in fact a meeting with God. Uh, God comes in three persons, the Trinity, and God, the Godhead, if you will, the Father, is not really a father, but in fact a large uh, African-American woman who's very much a baker and a cook and hugs him right away and welcomes him. The Son, Jesus, is a young Jewish man who's a carpenter. Um, the Spirit is an Oriental young woman who in fact um, breezes along with him through what he has to face in his life. This encounter with God in three persons is a beautiful story and it brought me to tears because it's coming for him to have to deal with dealing with the guilt and fear and sadness of losing his daughter to some kind of crazy man. Evangelicals and telev televangelists all panned it. Um, they felt it was non-traditional, a non-traditional way of, of showing God and some of them were just quite incensed that God would be betrayed as a um, large uh, African-American woman or as a, a young Jewish man or an Oriental young woman, uh, those Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, they were not happy about it because it was such an unusual way of looking at God. But if you've seen the movie or read the book, you know that what the author's trying to say to you is that God can come to us in many forms and in many ways. That God is a loving God and will try his best or its best or her best or whatever it is to reach us to help us forgive. Because the final scene of the whole movie really is about him being taken by God in a new form, that of Graham Greene, the Canadian actor who's a native actor, um, taken by an Aboriginal leader. And the Aboriginal leader says, for this purpose, I have to be God a father with you, to walk with you, um, to a place where his daughter's body is for burial. A box has been prepared by Jesus the carpenter and the spirit has planted above it to bring out flowers. And for him, he has to forgive. He has to learn to forgive what the killer did and recognize that his daughter is with a loving, loving God, that God will always be there for her and that one day he will see her again. It's a very powerful story. It certainly brought me to tears, but I think it would bring most of you to tears too. But it's not palatable to some who see God very traditionally, in very traditional ways. But then again, we have to remember ourselves that what we see God is not what the crowd sees God as, but sometimes how we encounter God. And how we encounter God, like that new movie about Fatima, may be as our Blessed Lady, or it may be as Jesus, or it may be as an angel, or it may be in many different ways, that God comes to us in many forms. And sometimes what's popular is not necessarily how God acts. This last weekend uh, was CPAC in the United States. Now CPAC is a group of conservatives who gather every year or so to raise money for conservative uh, political candidates, and mostly, of course, Republicans, to help fund the Republican candidates. Now they are very conservative, and what they did this year was present a golden bust of the former president, those, the president who has just lost the election to President Biden. A golden bust, a golden bust um, that was there on display of this former president. Worshipping men is like worshipping the golden idol in the desert of Sinai. Um, the people there are called to build a golden calf to worship because God seems to have forsaken them. And Moses has helped, with God's help, brought them out of Egypt into a land of promise through the Red Sea, but they're tired, they're angry, they make a gold idol, a golden calf, and they worship the golden calf. It's somehow unfortunate becomes a symbol of their disobedience to God. As a disobedience to God, so is any golden idol going to be somehow some kind of idol that is taking us away from what is true and what is right. We know that because we saw it happen to people like Mussolini and Hitler and Stalin. People had to worship them, they had to follow them wherever they led. I mean, Hitler provided for his people in Germany jobs during the Great Depression. He brought about 
changed for them, things got better. Germany walked out of shame into a new beginning and it was a wonderful new beginning for those people. What they couldn't see was, as popular as he might have been, that he would lead them down to a path of infamy and death and destruction. What they couldn't see was by worshipping a human being, by being popular with human beings, they were going to unfortunately take a very bad road. And it's frightening to see pictures of so many people, even young people, with their hands outstretched, you know, saying their obedience to this Nazi movement. And it was same true in Italy with the fascists and true in Russia with the Stalinists. You know, they worshipped a man rather than God. Jesus did not please everyone. As much as those leaders who are dictators try to please most people, Jesus didn't please anyone, especially at the end of his life. At the end of his life, nobody's following him. He might have had people following him in the beginning by the thousands. But as he began to say, I'm not just here to heal. I'm not here as a magician. I'm here to take a tough road. A tough road that will lead to death and destruction and pain. And then there will be a resurrection. There will ultimately be a happy ending to this story. But right now it's not. And people turned aside. Remember that entry into Jerusalem? Thousands of people lined up. They throw palm branches and everything in front of him. They lay the path for Jesus for him to come into Jerusalem. But then when nothing happens, the crowd turns. The crowd becomes the same group who shout, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He has not pleased the crowd. He has not pleased humanity. And Jesus could not please everyone because his job was not to please people. It was, in fact, to do the, the work of God, to do God's work here on earth with us. And so it was hard. It was a hard thing to do, and it would never, never be popular. It's a disease that we fight that's as deadly, in a sense, as the coronavirus, the COVID-19. It's called entitlement. Entitlement says, basically, we have a right to have what we have. Some are better than others and get it. Entitlement has, in effect, done some terrible things lately. For instance, many people are lined up to get their shots, their vaccine, to fight the COVID-19, the coronavirus. Um, many of the families of executives, the families of people who own nursing homes, have gotten their shots early because there's a sense of entitlement that if you are an executive, if you're somebody important, you should get your shot before everybody else. I remember as a boy that I helped my parents at the Children's Aid and Family Service when they bought Christmas gifts for people who were needy so that they could come in and look around and pick gifts for their children because they didn't have a lot of money at Christmas to spend on their kids. So we had a huge room full of Christmas gifts that people who were needy could come in and pick gifts for their family. We have had, by the second day of that, we had to turn people away because People were coming who didn't really have a need, but they said, if they get it, I should get it. In other words, if poor people should get it, why can't I get it? It's that sense of entitlement. If they're entitled, why not me too? And so basically the program on the third or fourth year had to shut down because too many people were demanding what they should get. My wife and I had the same experience with turkeys at Christmas. The two churches in town, uh, the United Church and ourselves, got together and the first year we distributed uh, 14 turkeys with all the fixings to people who were in need. The next year, had list had gone up to 35 or 36, I believe, and the following year it was up to 100 and something because everybody felt they should get it too. No matter what their economic background, they should get these turkeys as well. well you know, the problem with trying to feel, fit everybody and to make sure that you please everybody is a dead end. The Colosseum in Rome still stands, but it stands as a testament to trying to please the people of Rome. In that Colosseum, there were games, there were gladiator fights which people were killed at, and eventually Christians were put in there to be fed to the lions. They were there to please the crowds of Rome, and the emperors of Rome wanted to make sure the people were happy. They were pleased. They were looked after. I'm sure it did not please God to see people slaughtered or people eaten alive or people who were taken. Jesus could not ever please men. His path was the path of God. The path of God with human beings will never be a popular path. 
It will force us to look into ourselves like these 40 days of Lent. It will force us to take something that we have value to and say, you know, it's not really mine. It belongs to God. I can't take it with me. I can't take my gold, my silver, well, it's just a way of saying my money with me. I can't ever have all those things I want forever. This is a passing thing, and when I put the ashes on my forehead, I was reminded that I'm dust, and to dust I will return. I owe God my life, the beauty of creation around me, all that's good in my life, and that will be fighting against what is always popular with human beings. Yesterday I saw a list of the richest people in every country, the richest people, and I noticed the number of people who saw that on the computer was in the thousands. People are torn by this sense of wanting to get what they can get, wanting to be popular, wanting to walk the way of humanity, and recognizing that God demands more of us to save this creation at the cost of jobs, maybe, to save this world, maybe at the cost of so many billions of dollars, to save our humanity, maybe at the cost of all those things we think are important. Somehow we have to recognize God demands us so much of us that is not popular with human beings. And Jesus has to say it. You're not out to please humanity. You're out in this world to please God and to find God in your life. May this Lenten journey help you to find God and to find always what may not be popular, but it was really right and known to be right in the, in the face and the faith of God and Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, send your spirit into our hearts. Comfort us in all our afflictions. Defend us from all error. Lead us into all truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Blessed Savior, at this hour you hung upon the cross. You stretched out your loving arms. Grant that the people of the earth may look to you and be saved for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. Almighty Savior, at midday you called your servant Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Fill this world with the radiance of your glory, that all the nations of the world may come and worship you, for you live and reign forever. Amen. Almighty God, whose Son was revealed in majesty before he suffered death on the cross, give us faith to perceive his glory, that being strengthened by his grace, we be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Life is short. We do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love. Make haste to be kind. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you this day and every day. Amen.